Welcome. I'm Darcesia Rollins, the Assistant Director of Kara Circle, the nonprofit programming arm of Kara's Books and More, the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. Thank you to tonight's event partners, the Auburn Avenue Research Library on African American Culture and History, and Fur Keeps Books, a shop for rare and classic Black books. Throughout tonight's event, a research librarian from Auburn Avenue will be dropping supplementary resources into the chat for you to come back and check out at the end of the event. Please know that the chat will stay up after the event so you don't need to divide your attention during the program. We are excited to have viewers from all over the world joining us tonight. So feel free to shout out where you're watching from in the chat. And if you have a question for any of the tonight's uh, presenters, please put your question in the ask a question box at the bottom center of your screen. If you see a question that you like that someone else has asked, you can upvote that question to make sure it gets seen. Finally, as a 45 year old radical independent feminist bookstore in the South, it means a lot when you buy your book directly from us. So if at any time tonight, you wanna buy Black Futures for yourself or as a gift, please go ahead and click that till button at the bottom of your screen and it will take you right to the book on our website. I've been so excited about this event and book uh, since I first learned about this project, I think last year when Kimberly Drew was at the Decatur Book Festival. And I'm really excited to invite tonight's host, Theo Tyson, because she's simply amazing. So please welcome Theo Tyson, a, cur a curator and avant-garde academic. Her research is firmly rooted in historical and contemporary photography and the performativity of fashion and identity. She uses fashion, art, and sociology to marry visual and material culture as an accessible universal language to offer tutorial narratives that provide unique points of entry for civil, civil discourse. Having worked previously with SCAD Fast, Museum of Fashion and Film, and Spelman College Museum of Fine Art, Tyson is currently the Polythere Star Fellow in American Art and Culture at the Boston, Boston Library. Thank you, Theo. Thank you, Dartracia. And welcome everyone. We've got over 200 guests here, which is amazing. Thank you for joining us this Saturday evening. Uh, let's get started with our illustrious guests. We have the editors of Black Futures with us, starting with Kimberly Drew, who's a writer, curator, and activist. Drew received her BA from Smith College in Art History and African American Studies. During her time at Smith, she launched the Tumblr blog, Black Contemporary Art, which has featured artwork by nearly 5,000 Black artists. Drew's writing has appeared in Vanity Fair, L, UK, and Glamour. Um, also just recently authored a book, have to drop that in there. She lives in Brooklyn, New York, just a few blocks away from Jenna Wortham, who is up next. Jenna is a staff writer for the New York Times Magazine. She is also co-host of the podcast, Still Processing, as well as a sound healer, Reiki practitioner, and herbalist, all of which she lovingly practices on Kimberly Drew. She's currently working on a book about the body and disassociation. She lives in Brooklyn, New York. And next up, we have two contributors of the many contributors to Black Futures. First, we have Donovan X. Ramsey. Donovan is an indispensable voice on issues of identity, politics, and patterns of power in America. Ramsey, thank you, <laughs> served most recently as the commentary editor at the Marshall Project, a Pulitzer Prize winning news organization dedicated to the U.S. criminal legal system. Ramsey holds a master's degree from the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism and a bachelor's degree in psychology from Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, where he lives and is currently completing his first book, a history of the crack cocaine epidemic for One World, who also published, since Donovan did this already, Black Futures. And last but certainly not least joining us tonight is Antonio Johnson, an emerging visual artist whose work focuses on concepts of home and healing. Johnson is a self-taught photographer who was raised in West Philadelphia and educated at Morgan State University, a historically black college in Baltimore, Maryland. Today he calls Brooklyn home. His work is undeniably intimate, authentic, and without frills. His work, John, Project You Next, focuses on barbershops as sites for the cultivation of black male identity and wellness. 
in exploring barber shops. He's interested in capturing how those spaces and the communities within them are constructed and maintained. He has a steadfast desire to create images of otherwise hidden parts of society. Ultimately, by shining a light on spaces like barbershops, he hopes to create relationships between them and viewers' connections that would not otherwise exist. Welcome, everyone. Um, the book just came out, Black Futures, on December 1st. So we're four days old now. So congratulations, Kimberly and Jenna. So I think we have to start with how we got to this um, what you've been quoted as saying is basically an, an, a super ambitious zine because that's where this idea started. So let's talk about where the idea started, get to how Donovan and Antonio come into the picture and then dig into some other stuff. How does that sound? Cool. So Kimberly, I'll start with you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction, Theo. It's such a pleasure to have you with us. Um, a big and huge shout out to all of the greater Atlanta area. Um, we really started what is this tour about a year ago, Indicator, um, in this beautifully curated session um, by Jenna, interested in you know really highlighting queer authors. And we had such an incredible turnout back when we could all convene. And so this event means a lot in this area, um, in the world means a lot to us and this book project. Um, and then also I wanted to say just for housekeeping, we were trying to have CART and trying to have interpreters on this call, um, but unfortunately that wasn't possible. This will be uploaded to YouTube with full captioning later. So there will be another point of access for anyone who um, is tuning in and finding it difficult to follow along. Um, so where does it start? It starts in many, many different places. Um, first and foremost, I think um, there are two different axes on which it started. For me, I started as a fan of Jenna Wortham, as I'm sure many people on this call are. Um, when you just stand someone so much, the universe is like, we're going to give you a crumb. <laughs> we're going to give you a crumb on today. <laughs> and a uh, little did that I know. That crumb coming in the form of a DM, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, I was on the bus one day and I got a DM from Jenna and we connected, interested in making a project that kind of looked like this one. As you mentioned, it started as a zine project and has expanded into this really greater mechanism. Um, and there's much more to say on that. And then I can talk about how Donovan and Tone got involved as well because they're, I mean, I just love our origin story. <laughs> and so I'm also really <laughs> excited to have y'all both here. Um, but yeah, I'll, I won't I won't continue to blather on, but thank you all so much for being here on a Saturday. Jenna, you, you slid into the DMs. What, what happened? I did slide into the DMs. I was a huge, fan of Kimberly's and um, the Tumblr Black Contemporary Art and was just looking for a reason to say hello. Um, I'd been working as a technology reporter for quite some time for the Times and felt like there was a story that I wasn't able to tell. I was looking at the rise of social media sites and services and then also observing this like flourishing of Black culture and Black art and just dialogue too. And, one of the earliest um, indicators for me that this might be something to work on was at the Beyonce Formation Tour project. I mean, the tour concert, excuse me. And um, Beyonce was performing and just doing her Beyonce thing and her hair was everywhere. And she whisked off stage and the interstitials came down. And there were all these YouTube celebrities in the video, including Evelyn from the internet. And I just was so taken aback. I was like, wow, Beyonce is talking to us now on this stage and showing everybody. So it felt like maybe it'd be right for some sort of project. And I definitely thought, okay, we should just do a one-off quick zine thing. Maybe it's another Tumblr. Maybe it's a quick art installation. I don't know. And Kimberly was the one that had the foresight and the real prescience to look at me in that incredible Kimberly Drew way that just levels you. That was like, this is a book. And I was like, I guess it is, I guess it is. And so that's how we got here. And and so five. that's the thing is, and, oh, you just said the five years and I wanted to point to that because there is a lot of, there's a lot of social media in the book, but books take time. Um, they take a lot of time. They also take a lot of money. They, they're not 
produced in the same way that zines are produced and talking of times in Tumblr and thinking about Kimberly and Jenna between the two of you. Um, I want to start getting into how Donovan and Antonio became part of this project because both of you, your reach is insane. If we can just look at the artists that are included in like, this is, it's a few of them. There's some recognizable names. There's some that we should all learn and know. So how did you get to selecting and selecting the contributors? And then I wanna talk a little bit about placing them, but then that gets us into the, the chapter. So one step at a time, let's start with, maybe one of you take how Donovan came on board and the other one take how Antonio came on board. Can I tell the story, Kimberly? I was going to say, I was like, yes, I was yes, like, yes, 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 yes. So I love this story because it's so random, but it's such like a beautiful example of Wait, the, Donovan, your video might not be on, though. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah? OK, so like it's a really random, but I think really important example of like organic community building where uh, we had been we we both have been invited independently to the ted conference in like vancouver which is so big and corporate and like super fancy and like a little bit weird because it's like all these like tech people and um of course i had known of kimberly from all her amazing work and she was sort of just like sitting in like the lobby at the somewhere hotel, being looking, fabulous somewhere being fabulous, fabulous and beautiful so I decided to like try to strike up a conversation. And, you know, instead of doing like the like the usual New York kind of thing of being like, hi, who are you? What do you do? Like, for whatever reason, I just asked her like where she was from. And we both talked about our upbringings in Ohio and in New Jersey, right? And um, just found this like point of connection in talking about, you know, having like, working class parents, but being like eccentric kids with all these different like eclectic interests. And it was just like a real soul to soul moment where like I got really emotional, Kimberly got really emotional and we didn't have any idea of like what the contribution was gonna be, but she was like, I'm doing this book and I want you to write something in it. And, and that was it. So in stopping right there for a second, Kimberly, you didn't know what you wanted Donovan to contribute. Donovan, how did you decide what to contribute? Because your piece is the myth of the crackhead and you have a book coming out next fall um, when crack was king. Um, and I found it very striking the way that you approach this because it's about language um, mm -hmm. just as much as it's about anything else. And one of the things I wanted to to push into was why did you want to ensure that the history of the crack epidemic was in a book about black futures? And how did you decide what to present knowing that you have this book coming out? And then again, you're in yeah. conversation with so many other amazing contributors. Well, yeah, I think that's a really good question. I, um, you know, in writing the book, I, I uh, knew that there was something Sorry, guys, that's my puppy making noises. Do you, do you want to say hello very yes, quickly? Yes, of course. His name is Benny. He's a little spoiled. OK, Benny, you had your moment. So <laughs> in putting together- Get Benny you know, a my, handle. Get Benny a handle. <laughs> <laughs> in putting together my contribution, you know, I had been thinking about all the elements that really sort of um, were just, it just sort of kept coming back to me, both memories of growing up um, you know, in the 90s as a, crit, at, 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 as a kid at the tail end of the crack epidemic and how, um, you know, my career, I, I write primarily about the criminal justice system. And in talking about efforts at reform, efforts at abolition, I kept running into these ideas that people had about what the epidemic was and who the people were that were caught up in it. Mm -hmm. So what that said to me was that, you know, in order for us to move forward, as a community, we really have to reevaluate often myths um, about the epidemic, myths about who we are as a people, about who we were at that time. Maybe that stereotypes so that we accepted about ourselves that we should not have that have kind of 
We can Absolutely. have a whole separate conversation about visual culture and kind of what the media said that we should believe about what was the crack epidemic and how that happened and who it affected. And a I, thousand you, percent. Yeah, and you made it really personal because you had the you had the story about Whitney Houston there, which is something that everyone can immediately connect to. But I immediately walked away wondering where Michelle was. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, that idea of presenting the future, but talking about this also very painful thing from the past. And with that, I'm going to jump to there's, would you want to call them Kimberly and Jenna chapters or sections? Um, Before we move forward though, I just want to jump in and add one of the pieces of the story that Donovan might not remember just because it's very Ooh, valuable. Okay. I don't actually share this with either of you. Um, one of the things that also came up during our initial conversation at TED on those beautiful like chaise lounge red chairs in Vancouver, um, Donovan sat me down after I think like day two of us being in this like strange bubble and was like, so what are you doing about hair? And I was like, nothing. And then Donovan and it like the most Oprah shit ever was like, well, how do you feel about your hair? And I was like, <laughs> I kind of wish I didn't have it. And Donovan was like, well, you might have your answer. You need to dig more into that. And then through this incredible osmosis, it's Donovan's participation in this book. That's why we have contributions from Akinola Davies, this hair of mine. This is why we have Tone's work and you next. Like it opened up this Beautiful. challenge to really tackle black hair in a way that felt really generative because I, I realized in our conversation, like I'd written about hair a ton of times, but never was able to sit with someone in honesty about my own personal relationship and how it's all tied up into identity and all these other things. And so um, that was also part of the emotion and why I really appreciate Donovan so deeply. Thank you. Donovan, you look like you want to say one more thing. No, my like heart is just full right now. <laughs> we can stay there. We can stay there for a second. That's perfectly fine. <laughs> but Antonio, how do you want to, who wants to Jenna, Antonio? We, Donovan has set a precedent of, of who tells the story. I'll tell the story. Go for it. I um I had I met Kimberly a few times like just randomly at different places like maybe I saw her at a brunch or maybe I saw her at a new thing. Um, but I believe that after the friendship that blossomed in Vancouver at TED, Donovan shared that I was also working on um, a project about black hair, but black men's hair, um, and specifically as it relates to the barbershop. Um, and I had started. A, I think at the time in which Kimberly reached out to me, I had literally just come off of a very successful Kickstarter uh, where I brought in all of my community, all of the barbershop community to help me raise some cash to go on this tour to show what I felt like was the magic that happens when you sit down in a chair at the barbershop to get a haircut. You are held by your barber. You are um, in community with the people there. Um, and, you know, not only do you get a physical change, but I really believe that there's something that happens um, mentally um, as you go through those revolutions. Um, so, you know, Kimberly reached out to me. She sent me a nice little note and was like, we would love to have you a part of this project. And I was like, um, how could I ever say no? Like, whatever the details are, I'm down. And then when uh, they came to, when Jenna and Kimberly came to Decatur, we like all hung out, had some tacos, drink some ginger you beer. Guys, where, from where? where? Where were you if you were in Decatur? You know do you remember? Actually, I do not remember the name of the restaurant, but it was a good time. Th this is important. <laughs> <laughs> it was across the street from this cute little like Episcopalian church. And they had yeah. like maybe a palm tree in the logo. There was outdoor seating. Yeah. Picnic benches. It was like a barbecue spot. It was delicious, though. Yeah, I yeah. might know where you're talking. We're we're gonna find figure this out. Someone in the audience knows exactly where you were. <laughs> <laughs> so, both of you, okay, you, Antonio and Donovan, you both shared the, what you offer to the book, and I was just starting to talk about the 
what we're calling them categories, chapters, sections, because the way the book is designed is very specific. So what's the what's the nomenclature that you're using for the way that you've you've organized it? And as we were try that again. Jenna's, Jenna's channeling something very futuristic right now. I know. This, <laughs> this, 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 this. Jenna, I think, can you check and make sure that you don't have any extra tabs open? Wow. We'll get through this in just one second. <laughs> Not come on out for features. I look dead. Filing <laughs> in. So's my. This is. I, I'm. I mean, I'm all for performance, so I feel like we're just gonna say that this was planned. Yes. No. I think it's all good. We're all <laughs> here. I will just hop in while um, we're figuring that out to say that. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Um, the. I guess. What have we been calling them? Um, I guess categories. It was theme. Okay. It was originally um, the beautiful editorial arm and um, gift from Chris Jackson, who um, five years ago welcomed us to the One World office. And we came in and we're like, we're going to talk about virality on the internet and blackness and black culture and build this archive that stretches maybe from the 80s or 90s to the present day. And we started collecting things and building all of these different folders and all the spaces that you could imagine from the Google Docs to the Dropboxes and um, went back to Chris and he was like, okay, y'all need to find some organizing principles to mm -hmm. help you um, find your way through this book process. And then that paired with the incredible design work of Marcos Key, our design duo who we love and this book would not be possible without um, them building this like rhizomatic book design that helped to make it have the look and feel of the internet, but not be too like internet, you know, <laughs> right, um, right. That's definitely an energy that happens sometimes. Um, no shade to it. But it yeah. has kind of the, 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 it feels like a guide, which is what you talk about in relationship to how you set this up of if people want to know, like this is a time capsule of sorts. Precisely, but not buried in the yard. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Speaking of it being buried in the yard, let's talk about accessibility because we have this idea of a zine. This connection started in the, the interwebs. And so when you talk about accessibility, there there's a lot of differences in having something that is available to the open to the public, available online, and something that is in book format. Um, it becomes a question about price point. We had a brief nod to how expensive and different production is for something that is printed like this versus a zine. So in speaking about who the intended audience is for Black Futures, what is being offered in regards to kind of like a cost proposition for investing in this book? And what are your thoughts on how are you going to make it as accessible as possible to people that even at the lowest price point, it's still unattainable for them? Can we try Jenna again? Mm. No. Maybe you just refresh. Maybe we can refresh. And actually thinking about, um, because Antonio, I know one of the things with your project is that it's traveling. It's not just one particular barbershop that you're looking at. You're looking at barbershops in different cities, you know. Both of them the have really done projects that are I'm like right. pointing at you. Um, <laughs> As they're moving around. <laughs> yeah, multimodal projects. I mean, I, I, I don't want to like jump in too much here, but I am also curious about, because one of the conversations Donovan and I had was about mm -hmm. collecting and what it means to stop into different places 
And I wonder if we can maybe talk about that too while we're waiting for Jenna, like what does it mean to encounter, especially like you're talking about these subjects that are particularly heavy, whether that's a vulnerability and exchange in a space of beauty, in a space of worship in many ways, like there's so few places beyond like church and the barbershop where pe black people are unkempt and then having these really incredible conversations that I'm sure evoke a lot of emotion about the, the impact of the crack uh, pandemic or e epidemic rather, um, how you both as, as authors and writers manage that, I'm curious to hear. And I'm sure the audience would love to hear too. Donovan, you wanna, you wanna take a first go at it? Yeah, and just absolutely. to, and just to I mean, point out, we were talking um, about the categories. Donovan is in the legacy category and Antonio is in the black is still beautiful category, just to kind of put that in perspective with the categories. And we can talk about the, the other eight a little bit later on. Yeah, so it was really incredibly important to me to travel the country to report out my book. Um, when crack was king, because um, you know, having lived in a few different places across the country, I came to understand that we have this big general idea of what the crack epidemic was, but that it impacted people very differently, um, you know, based on their identities, based on just locality, right? So, you know, a city like Los Angeles, for example, that is ground zero for the crack epidemic, um, also had a significant, you know, gang presence in the, you know, mm -hmm. Crips in the Bloods which then led to turf wars and significantly more violence. Um, then you might also have a city, you know, for example, like um, Detroit mm -hmm. or say Baltimore. So a city like Baltimore that didn't have a gang presence, but that there had already been a um, significant um, uh, epidemic around uh, heroin use. Right. So and thinking acted, about the fact that sometimes these barber shops also acted as they were the they were the gang free zones, they were the safe havens, they were the the neutral place that you could go yeah. in the community. Yeah, Tone can definitely speak more to that, like, you know, be, being able to kind of. Well, and that's the thing, just connecting the two of them, because you were talking right. about some of them suffered through heroin, some of them suffered through this. And it's like, where are these people going? Where are these neutral places that they can go for safety? Like, again, sure. just how are these all connected together? Yeah, like not to give away too much of the book, <laughs> bring it out. Give us a the, you can give us a little bit. <laughs> so one of the big questions that I had kind of going into it is sort of how did Black America survive the crack epidemic with very little help from the federal government, with very little support from, you know, our, um, uh, compatriots, right? Like in this country. And the answer is community. That mm. the thing that we do better than anybody else is finding a stranger who looks like you and moves like you and sounds like you and creating family out of that and weaving together a safety net where it doesn't exist anywhere else. And that's in the churches. It's in, um, you know, people's houses and in nightclubs and parties. It's in places like barbershops that, um, that we held each other together. And that's how we survived it. And that's the one technology really that we take with us from the past into the future. Yeah. 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 Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Antonio? Yeah, so for me, it was also incredibly important to travel. I grew up in Philly and everybody knows that I'm a huge supporter and love the barbershop culture in Philly. Um, my uncle, my mom's youngest bar uh, brother was a barber, and the barber that I have gone to for most of my life um, is a guy named G, who is Muslim. And inside of the shop, in between haircuts, we would see him pray. And I thought that that was such a beautiful um, expression of his faith, but also just to be so comfortable in doing so. Um, oftentimes, you know, when we pray, it's like to ourselves and we have to go somewhere private mm -hmm. or just inside of a specific structure like a church. Um, and he was able to do that and do it freely. Um, and that just always stuck with me. And I was curious to know if other things, other communities were happening, um, if other things that were happening in communities and barbershops around the country. Um, and in doing so, I... I found that to be true, you know, in Oakland, in LA, they had worked with um, doctors in the area to help 
um, you know, people who didn't have access to health care, you're talking about accessibility, didn't have access to health care, they could do that while they were in the chair because they were always going there to feel mm -hmm. safe, to be, uh, you know, in a, in a place that made them feel seen and made them feel whole. Um, and it's my idea that, you know, while the barbershop is not a perfect space, right, it has the capacity to make you feel whole and to have some element of healing. Right. Um, and, Actually, I want to, Antonio, I want to stop you right there as in it not being a perfect space, because I think I think one of the more glaring things about the barbershop that we can immediately speak to, and Kimberly, this can be attributed to your activism as well, is there's there's a sense of toxic, toxic masculinity that rests in barbershops in certain communities especially in perhaps those communities that are affected by the crack epidemic that Donovan is talking about. So in thinking about the future of barbershops, how do we make sure that they don't become these breeding grounds for homophobia, transphobia, misogyny, all of those things? Because there are, of course, contributors to this book that are members of community that have been discriminated against or have felt unsafe in barbershops and sometimes are actually disproportionately affected by drugs because of a loss of community. So can we speak to the way that this is also kind of a, this book acts as a safe space as well for the black community? Absolutely, I mean, I think, you know, just speaking, specifically to the barbershop space, I, I recognize that it is not perfect. I recognize that it has its flaws and its challenges, but I really do believe that we can confront that to change it. And I think that we have seen some evidence of that being possible, right? There are barbershops in Brooklyn. There are barbershops in Atlanta. There are barbershops in LA. Specifically, I, I can think of Kane uh, in Crown Heights. It is a barbershop that is specifically dedicated to um, our queer uh, brothers and sisters. And, you know, and I think that it's important that we maintain those spaces and that we find ways to invest in them so that they are around for future generations um, and for people who may not feel safe otherwise. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm really happy to know that those types of things are, are set in place. Yeah, I will hop in here too. I think for us as you know, editors of this text and Tone and I spent a lot of time together on the UNEX entry in the book. And I feel so thankful that through the process of making, you know, taking this thing that already existed and is this beautiful book that Tone has made that everyone should get. I'm so proud to own my own copy. Um, that there was an insistence on including what it meant for people across the gender spectrum to go into barbershops. Right, um, and I think right. similarly throughout the Black Futures book, what we aim to do is to take the most generous um, kind of wrap around all Black spaces and not to say that this Black space does this or this Black space does that, or you have to be this type of person to be a farmer, or you have to be this type of person to be a mm -hmm. um, For us, it's really about expanding the ways in which we might be understood. It's about, um, yeah, just continuing to make as much breath and space for what it means to be black and alive as we possibly can, because I think we can often find ourselves in spaces where there's a lot of assumptions made about us. There's a lot of assumptions right. made about our churches. There's a lot of assumptions made about our barbershops. There's a lot of assumptions made about our books even. And I think for Jenna and I in this week, especially, you know, the thing that we really want to drive home is that we tried our very best to make a book that could speak to many different Black experiences. And I want to nail that home. You know, I want my mom to love it in the same way that I want, you know, these, like, the cool kids that, like, I wish that thought would I, that I was cool too. Um, I think you've succeeded. Yeah. I think yeah. you've succeeded. And one of the things yeah. that I really like about the way the book is set up is it still has that sort of zine feeling. So we talked about the category. So I just want to list those real quick. There's 10 of them. So Black Lives Matter, Black Futures, Power, Joy, Justice, Ownership, Memory, Outlook, Black is in parentheses, still beautiful, and Legacy. And 
they're all so rich with so many different artists and authors and authors on artists and, and vice versa. But I love the fact that you can pick it up and start anywhere. How important was that to you? Because even thinking about accessibility for someone who maybe doesn't want to sit down and read a book at the moment, they can still hone and glean a huge amount of information for this. And thinking about that from an editor's perspective, but also a contributor, especially with pre-existing projects of how do you kind of make this perfect little bite-sized nugget to put in this book. Should I try? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, it's perfect. Yes. <laughs> yes. Shout out to everyone in the chat who gave tips. I followed them all. Thank you very much. Happy to be back. And thanks for putting up with that. Um, I really, really appreciate that question, Theo. And I think, you know, our publishers really encouraged us to start thinking about loosely organizing the book into themes. But, you know, our, our graphic design team, Marcus Key, was really influential and instrumental in creating the visual language throughout the book. You know, it was, it was very clear early on, we wanted a book that was not chronological, that didn't make any sense at all to us. We weren't gonna try to do a timeline. And we wanted people to feel, I mean, I often start with books in the back and make my way forward. I love books that I can just pick up and I don't feel like that magazine pressure. hangover thing starting from the back, right? Yeah, no front <laughs> of the book, no back of the book, no wells, exactly. You know what I'm talking about. Um, and you know, I remember early on in an early design meeting, Kimberly was like, can the book be a circle? You know, and, and they were like, no, but we can work out, you know, um, other navigational systems with colors. And, you know, there are little referential guides in the book that say related entries. So you can kind of travel around throughout the book and one entry can lead you to another. And, you know, I was sitting here listening to everybody chat. Um, and I was thinking a lot about even though Donovan and Tone's sections are their sorry their contributions are in different chapters, right. they actually could both be under a section called care because they're about you know, Donovan's making this argument in the essay, you know, let's stop denigrating people who are suffering from the conditions of being impoverished and addiction. And let's, let's stop further, you know, finding ways to, you know, further banish people who are struggling within our communities. And let's think about why we do that. Let's think about how we manage our own fear and terror. And Tone on the other end is like, even when you're afraid and even when you're stressed out, even when you're struggling, like, here's what it looks like to go to a safe space. And, allow yourself to receive care. And they're both just beautiful meditations on how we care for our communities, how we care for each other. And those are constantly evolving categories and constantly evolving practices. And they really both come back to vulnerability, which is like another theme too, you know? So I think there's something really interesting and we did have to organize the book because we have so much material. There's almost 600 pages in the book and our publishers were like, you might wanna think about you know, section fronts essentially, but so much of the material that's in the book, you know, hopefully flows back and forth because these are just some of the themes that emerged, but they really don't encapsulate the totality of what's in the book. Right, right. Kimberly, did you, oh, I saw, I saw a hand up, I didn't know if you had something to, um, to add, to <laughs> <thing>. go ahead. <laughs> it's like, everyone knows the, the church finger. It's like, I have something that, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, like I just wanted to say as a contributor um, that um, the section that I that I contributed was something that I could not publish mm. anywhere else, right? Like it's a mix of like personal essay about growing up in Columbus, Ohio with a neighbor who was addicted to crack and trying to make sense of that, you know, when I'm five years old and then growing up and loving Whitney Houston and seeing her fall in the public's eye, right, from from the sort of highest highs that you can get mm -hmm. to with an American life to being and having her legacy really denigrated because of this issue that you had and how those two things kind of collapsed on themselves for me um, into these questions, right, about why right. do we do that? Why do we do that to Black people, to Black women in the, you know, example of my neighbor in Whitney Houston? And, um, you know, there wasn't room for that, you know, in the in the draft of my book. And there was, you know, not really any magazine that wants to publish that article, you know, all these years after Whitney Houston right. has passed. Um, but my futures was, you know, a project that was interested in those questions that I was asking, that was figuring out sort of 
um, you know, how we can also have that conversation. So I'm so grateful for how expansive the book is. I mean, she is thick. <laughs> she is thick with like, you know, and what that means is that, you know, because there is so much there's so much room for diversity of thought and opinion and aesthetic. Right, right. And uh, it, it, it. And you, you talk about this idea of changing the yeah. lexicon. And again, like, let's stop demonizing and criminalizing mental health and addiction and these things that are treated differently in different communities. This is also a conversation about white supremacy and racism and systemic health issues that I know we do not have time to get into this evening. But when you talk about creating a new lexicon um, and Kimberly and Jenna, you kind of put together this language of communication for current and future generations. One of the things that stood out in the book to me that's in the ownership um, category that was written by a dear friend of mine from Atlanta, formerly from Atlanta journalist, Erin Haynes. And she writes that black people must become guardians of our own legacy. And the thing is, when I read it, I heard it in her voice. And so it's a mandate. And so before we start taking questions, I see we have a few questions in the chat. What is the legacy of this book for each of you? And I know it's like it's four days old, so we're we're being we're being a little bit ambitious, but why not? Yeah, I can go first. Um, I think it's so. Thank you so much, Donovan, for saying that. Um, we honestly like haven't had a ton of time to get feedback directly from contributors on where their pieces fell in the book and how. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was really beautiful to get that feedback. I think having heard that, I hope that the legacy is that everyone who we were able to include in the book, because there's a million stories, as I'm sure you could imagine, with this many contributors. Right. Um, I hope that everyone feels that there was a space for them to be themselves. And I hope that that can maybe refract that energy onto those who might encounter this book such that they feel that they could do it for themselves. Because I think this year has been one of such reckoning and especially for those of us who are contributing on a cultural level, which I feel like happens in so many different nooks and crannies everywhere across the world, period. Doesn't have to be New York, doesn't have to be Atlanta, doesn't have to mm -hmm. be these major cities. Um, that we understand that we should hold the space for what we want to see made. Um, and, you know, with hopes, we'll be able to find the people who want to be the comrades with us and our ideas. Um, because one of the biggest things that we set out to do in this book was to make sure that people like this could be what they wanted. Um, some people were like, that's just freedom. And other people uh, like Donovan were like, let me stretch out a little bit. And I think right. it resulted in an even more beautiful book. Agreed. Agreed. Donovan, your name was said last, so how about you? What do you hope people will, will take away from the book as a whole? Because I know that you're excited about the other contributors to the book, as Antonio, you are too. So really quickly, who else are you super excited about in the book? Um, and then what do you hope people can take away from what your contribution was? Tone, you want to go? <sighs> Somebody got uncomfortable. Right, was like, "Let me think about this for a second. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, the question was just going. <laughs> um, you know, I am. Um, I'll say this: I'm kind of new-ish to the photography and art space, so I'm just so honored to be um, in conversation with so many brilliant artists. Um, so, thank you, Kimberly and Jenna, for thinking of me enough to include me um, in this. Um, I think for the legacy of you know of, of of the book, you know, I started you next way before any of this current state of the world they're in, just like you guys. And um, I have always thought that the barbershop would be the way that it all it always was, the way that it appeared. Um, and as we're you know moving forward into the future, things can change. You know, things right. are it's possible that we may never go back to that. Um, and having, you know, the work situated with so many um, brilliant contributors is really um, beautiful to me because it is a, a way to see how we were 
at that time, right? For for the future, mm-hmm. um, and that is that's really comforting to me, and I'm I'm very excited about that. Wonderful. Yes, I know my my barber shop does not look the same inside anymore. So, yes, thank you for that. Um, Jenna, actually, why don't do you want to jump in because we have not heard that much from you? I would love to hear what your thoughts are. Um, you know, actually, I was thinking a lot about Erin's piece, which you mm. and she's one of our contributors, and she actually spent a lot of time with Vashti, who runs an incredible, incredible, incredible organization called the Colored Girls Museum, and it's in Philadelphia. And Erin actually took me. Um, so it's kind of neat to actually, you know, people who are listening are kind of getting a sense of how pieces came together for the book. Like we really did encounter them in the real world. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Aaron is an old, old friend of mine, journal friend. And I, you know, in the before days took the Amtrak up with a couple of friends and we made a day out of it. And Aaron and Vashti are, are quite close. And so we got this incredible tour and we spent the whole day there. And I just kept thinking about it over and over again, because Vashti has in her home, her personal home, you know, mm-hmm. this amazing collection of work by artists, um, a lot of black women and black femmes and, you know, names that of artists that I know, or, I mean, you know, and then I had the good luck of going maybe the next week or within a couple of weeks to Brooklyn Museum, who was doing this retrospective on black radical art and a lot of the same names that were in the Brooklyn Museum, you know, Vashi had also personally collected. And I was really reflecting with to Kimberly about how it felt to be encountering those works in the Brooklyn Museum versus like in somebody's home, a home space where there was food on the stove, there were kids Mm -hmm. in the house, you know, it felt like just a totally different way to encounter work that much of was made with us in mind, you know, for us to experience it in that way. And so I asked Aaron to write a piece about the museum and then also we did a little sidebar about how how to think about collecting work. Collecting art, yeah. How to think about collecting it. And so for me, when when the question of legacy comes up, I mean, I really hope the legacy of the book is vast and expansive and, and multifaceted in ways we can't even anticipate. But I certainly hope one legacy is that, you know, readers and, and people who encounter the book feel compelled to think about their own archives, right? And and that word is really loaded, but I just mean that you know, just own personal collections, whether that's what's in your closet, what's in your kitchen cabinets, what's, you know, the cookbooks on your shelves. You know, Kimberly has been saying all week that, you know, a cookbook is a kind of archive. It is its own legacy. And so just hope that we take a step back and look at our own world with new eyes and see everything that's in it as worth keeping track of and holding on as as precious as can be. I mean, that's, that's one of my favorite things throughout the book. And there are many guideposts within the book about how to look at your own immediate world and basically treat it in the same way as, as you know, this like high art institution, but just kind of recognize that we all already have that within us. So, and adjacent to us. Beautiful, beautiful. I think that's a good place to start taking some questions from our guests. Thank you all so much. I want to dive right in so we can get as many of these as possible. Mandana has asked, having already read this incredible, indefinable mansion, I can only imagine how hard it was for you to edit it down to its current three pounds. Back to Donovan, the the she's thick. (laughs) What were areas or individuals you wish you could have included, especially given our fast changing environment? And let me add, I think it's exquisite as it is. I'll never be done reading it. I'll hop in. I, I mean, I was waiting for Jenna to say Meg the Stallion. I was just like, um, <laughs> <laughs> we like just missed, you know, and, uh, you know, um, I think that I think Meg has been taking up so much of my brain space um, and good news is so important. I highly also recommend that. I also recommend doing both at the same time, black futures and good news um, really it's, it completes. Um, <laughs> and then I think this week, um, this past few weeks, Dan Warwick's tweets um, really would have such a happy home in my book. And um, I mourn that that happened after it was physically done. Indeed, indeed. That actually is a great segue into the next question, which is something that I was thinking about is this, this feels like a volume of sorts. And so Michaela Clark is asking, I've seen you all refer to this as the Black Futures Project. How are you imagining the project's expansion? 
And again, I want to be tender with these questions because the book is so new. Um, but I've seen some of the feedback on social media, if nothing else, just from the contributors. Um, so maybe I can go ahead and be forward and ask the question of Donovan Antonio, how much other things did you think about before you decided on what to contribute and would you be in an additional volume? And Kimberly and Jenna, can you even begin to wrap your mind around a volume two or three after five years of, of this one? Go ahead, Antonio. Well, first, if Meg is going to be in the next one, and <laughs> Dion and Warwick Street are going to be in the next one, I for sure have to be in. Um, you know, there, first writer I, refusal. I, first writer refusal. Absolutely. I um, I I feel really drawn to to concepts of home healing, and if there is any other way that I could share that and um, you know contribute that to to the next iteration of this, I will gladly do so. Um, but listen, we're, well, we want to ride the magic of this moment. So I know how important that is. Um, so that's, that's my little piece of advice to y'all. Just ride the magic of this moment. Speaking of riding the magic, let's talk about the magic of adding this to your own personal archives. Because again, I mentioned this as an investment in regards to accessibility and having this in your collection. Albrica Tierra is saying, speaking of your personal archives, what do your own look like outside of this book? Kimberly, you're doing the dance, so you got to go first. Uh, one thing that is definitely in my personal archive is the photos that Albrica took of Jenna and I when we were in Decatur. Uh, so precious. So glad that Albrica is here with us. Um, I, I also want to just lightly hit at the last question as well. Like, oh, sure. I think in many ways, the project of this thing, like, obviously, it is such a treat that Jenna and I are in a position in our business relationship, in our friendship, and in our capacity as editors that like, yeah, we could totally keep working, but also it just came out and I think it's enough to just let it be. Mm -hmm. um, but beyond that, I think that, you know, um, pieces like Aaron's, pieces like um, Mecca's, pieces like um, Sade's, pieces like um, Donovan's are inviting people to participate in the project and intention of this book um, in building and finding new language, in building and you know really regarding our own collection of things in mm -hmm. reapproaching family recipes and reapproaching the ways that we see some of our own spaces the larger project is really one of like reconciling that we all have the agency to record and we all are worthy of being recorded um and we don't have to make a new book to say that um i think this right. one kind of that's that's the you know that's kind of the intention of a guidebook, right? Is you have the one that you refer back to. So even if there were to be additional volumes, we could imagine that it would take some time. And as you just mentioned, Dion Warwick just started tweeting. So we've got so much more to look forward to, I think. Um, one of the things that I want to do, I know y'all have a lot of conversations lined up, Jenna and Kimberly with some of the other contributors from Black Futures, I wanna make sure that the two of you have a chance to engage in questions with Donovan and Antonio. What questions might you have for each other? Um, again, with this just coming out, you're in a bit of a whirlwind and who knows where this will take you. But while we're here in this space, what questions do you wanna ask of each other or what do you just wanna share with each other about this experience right now? I would love to know how you all are taking care of yourselves during the promotion of this book, because this is hard work, you know, talking about mm -hmm. and, you know, meeting people's expectations and publishers expectations and coordinating with so many different people. Like, what are you doing? I love that question, Donovan. Thank you. Jenna, that smile <laughs> says you go first. <laughs> I love it. I'm smiling because um, earlier today, Kimberly and I did a breathwork session with Shade St. Foxy, who's in the book, and she actually has a recipe for you know how to care for yourself and take a bath and how to do a little bit of a meditation. Um, I'm enrolled in her um, breathwork training program for Black Healers. And so at the end of every session, we do a breathwork session, and I was just like, let's do it outside. Like we, 
you know, just had a moment with that. And that was really incredible. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I really appreciate that, Donovan, because even asking that question is such an act of care, because if we weren't caring for ourselves, it would remind us to. So thank you for that. You're always such a sweetheart. Um, I think what's really tricky about this economy and also the things being digital is that, you know, there's really no bookended to how much you can work because we're just kind of all at home in front of screens mm -hmm. all the time. And that's been a new paradigm with the, with the pandemic. And it's something that takes a little bit of adjusting, like how do you create healthy boundaries between yourself and work um, anyway, when everything's virtual and also screen time can be really pleasurable. So what's the difference between scrolling for fun on TikTok, which I love to do, um, and then you get a work email and it's kind of this impulse to add insert as well. So having really healthy boundaries is yeah. key. Um, but I also want to say that I, one of the reasons I'm so grateful to have Kimberly as a collaborator and someone in my life is because we're both really, really good about, you know, the book never comes before our health. The book never comes before the wellness. And that isn't to say it's not a priority. It's the top priority and it has been in our lives for many years. But I also think we understand that the work doesn't end and, and right now we're kind of booking events through 2021 and yeah there are lots of questions about how we see ourselves extending this project if at all and so i think there's just this dawning awareness like we could literally work all the time and never be done right. and so how do we make sure that we're not sacrificing our psychological our spiritual and our physical well-being for work and the impulse is always to do more there's always another thing to hit, an event to do, a podcast to appear on, a radio show. And it doesn't right. diminish the gratitude or excitement that we even have to be in consideration, but just making sure everything is in balance. And so that's a huge, huge consideration. I think for me personally, um, I'm sleeping a lot right now. I've been sleeping. I've been really kind of making myself, even if I don't go to bed right away, because sleep is also very elusive right now. I've been sleeping I've had really poor sleep for the first time in my life, but just making sure that I'm in bed, even if I'm not tired, just like mm -hmm. I'm in bed at 11, like I just am, you know, and just with a book or with, you know, ocean sounds on, I'm just like already starting that wind down process. And um, slowing down in awareness, truly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and I then, think that's really important too, with the fact that again, because we move in this, I think Jenny pointing out that we're in such this, this digital space of impulse, Mm -hmm. Like you get the notification, you get the chime, you get the email, the text, whatever it is. And there's this compulsion to answer. Mm -hmm. And I think with the, you know, people consume things so quickly. And I think it goes without saying that this book is going to take some time to digest. And again, saying thank you to the idea of making it a book so it automatically slows us down. So thank you for kind of moving moving into that notion and again it's like there's so much here that we we have time before we have to talk about anything that's next because this is a lot to to digest um yeah. thank you for that yeah yeah one of the oh yeah yeah one of the things we've been hearing from folks is like i'm so sorry but i haven't read the whole thing and it's like that's not the thing. Right. There's no golden ticket. There's no eruption that happens. Although I wish I could program an eruption. Um, it really is about, you know, you know, when you open a book and you just open that page and you're like, damn, of course this would be my page, like a tarot deck. Right. Right. There's a right. beautiful Onyx tarot deck in the, in the um, book and there's a beautiful essay about it. Um, but it really is a choose your own adventure. It really is a book that is as much about literacy as it is about visual literacy as it is about um, you know, thinking about ancestral journeys. There's so many photos of people's cousins and grandmas in this book. <laughs> like, beautiful, beautiful. And it's not by mistake. It's really, it's really um, a destination where we want you to just arrive on your own time. Like speaking of church right. notions, it's like, baby, take your time. If this is your testimonial, like the seed, the floor, it's yours. <laughs> right. um, we, don't, we don't want much from you. We just want you to have this companion on your journey. If it feels good, if it don't feel good right now, it'll be there for you. I also just have to say that one of the best moments when the book first started going out in the world is Kimberly and I got a text from a friend of mine, Soraya, who was literally like, that is my cousin. And we were like, hot farmer, know what? That's your cousin. That's my cousin. And it was just like the blackest thing ever. It was so perfect. She literally like was like, hold on, page 274, you know, or whatever page it was. And that was just like, that was like the first indication where we were like, okay, this is like, is happening, it's hidden, it's doing what we mm -hmm. want to do. 
Well, hopefully we will have a chance to do this again. I am conscientious of time. We have nailed it within one minute and Donovan self-care. It's important. We want to respect how much energy all of you put into this. Thank you so much. Thank you to chairs, books, and more for having us this evening. If you don't already have the book, like they said, there's a little teal button down there on the bottom. Thank you, Tone. Thank you, Donovan. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Kimberly. Um,